Hey, everybody, and welcome to Key Conversations for Leaders. I'm your host, John Ryan, and today we have a very special guest, Karen Walker. Karen is an executive coach and consultant who advises CEOs and senior leaders on thriving in hyper growth. She has worked with clients including Aetna, AWS, Pfizer, JP Morgan Chase, and BMC Software, as well as Inc. 5000 startups. Karen is also a board advisor, keynote speaker, and the author of No Dumbing Down, a guide for CEOs on organization growth. As employee number 104 at Compaq, Karen helped lead the then fastest growing company in America, American history, growing from zero to $15 billion in revenue. Welcome to the show, Karen. Thank you, John. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for asking. Thank you. I, I want to start off by asking because, you know, employee number 104, that's an incredible thing to have in your pedigree. You know, wh what was it like to be employee number 104? Yeah, well, at the time, it was just employee 104, right? Um, we had no idea what was coming. We didn't, we hadn't shipped any products yet. It was um, 100 people sounds like a lot, but um, it really wasn't. I mean, we, uh, was a, we sort of always thought of ourselves as a big company in the formative stages. Um, but, um, you know, I would say the, it, it was, it was almost indescribable, uh, to be in a company that grew to $111 million in revenue its first year, and then be two something, three something, five something fastest to a billion, you know, and, and, and to be able to, to be in a situation where you could grow and develop your skills, right. To, to manage, uh, an organization and to, to lead in that kind of environment was just, uh, was unbelievable. Uh, and in part, uh, and we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, it was just that there was so much to do and how to figure out what to do and what not to do and how to hire the right kinds of people and um, uh, continue to work cross-functionally. And uh, it was it was amazing. I can just, I, did, I, I knew at the time it was, it was unusual, but I didn't fully appreciate it until I left. Yeah. Well, that certainly is an example of hyper growth, I would imagine. Um, and that's one of the, the areas that you focus on is helping companies to, to kind of manage and, and lead that type of development. Can you tell us about what hyper growth means to you and, and what are some of the challenges that go along with it? Sure. So um, I think about hyper growth, if you think about the S curve, right? Uh, hyper growth is that steep part of the S curve. And um, if you're fortunate enough to find yourself on it, uh, you know, you want to get all of the um, effectiveness that you can out of your organization to get you to the to the top or at least to the point where you can grab onto the next curve that's coming up. Um, so I've been working, I left Compaq, um, you know, it's, uh, it was $15 billion and about 17,000 employees. And at that point, although I had a lot of history there, it was like a, it was another big company. I had sort of, sort of lost for me the, the magic, right, or the reason that I joined. Uh, so I took some time off to figure out what I wanted to do next. I moved to New York. I took classes at Columbia. I had a consulting job follow my lap. And uh, I, took, um, adva I took advantage of that, and I really liked consulting. So I've been working with primarily, but not exclusively, as you said in the intro, tech CEOs for the last couple of decades now on how to navigate um, that. So I work with the, the leaders of the organization and their teams primarily. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there are a number of things you have to pay attention to, but um, it's it, at some point it comes down to execution, right? If you're in hyper growth, that means you found a product market fit. And so um, I'm not here to help you with that, although we can refine it. Uh, I'm here to help you create those internal strategies to support the external growth that you found. Uh, and so uh, making sure that we have uh, sort of alignment for goals, that the teams are working effectively uh, and that there is accountability in place uh, for the right things and that you create a culture of uh, sort of debrief and learn because so much is happening so fast. You need every opportunity to learn from that. So kind of unpacking a little bit what you're, what you're saying in terms of the hyper growth, it's not that you come in and help them find that ultimate market fit that gets them to go into that S curve, but once they're there, how do they make sure that they're following the the North Star to keep on going? Because imagine that that's a critical threshold, and and if they don't do it right, that they actually can slide backwards and have capacity issues and demand that's issues. Exactly. I imagine everywhere. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's about it's about delivering on the promise you made your customers, right? Because if you're on that curve, you have made a lot of promises. And uh, internally, you need to make sure that you're able to, to deliver on those um, if you're going to continue your growth. Uh, and it's not easy. Uh, there, there's, you know, there are many pitfalls along the way. 
Uh, so I would say you described that quite well. well thank you. Well, thanks for putting it out there so easily to understand. <laughs> With um, all the experience that you've had in, in your career, I imagine it feels like when I look at your resume that you've done just about everything, you've probably seen everything out there, of course, you know, to some degree. Is that where the idea of up and to the right come from comes from? And, and can you tell us a little bit about what that means to you? Sure. Um, so um, I would say, oh, no, I haven't done everything yet. <laughs> Constantly <laughs> looking for, for new challenges. I have been uh, very fortunate to be in the places I was in and be given the opportunities uh, and then, of course, there's been a lot of hard work to take advantage of those, but um, uh, it's a lot of that had to do with opportunity as well. Uh, but up and to the right, um, you know, I've been looking for sort of what summarizes uh, what I try to help people with uh, and explore with people. And um, it, it's a phrase I use all the time, in part because I, I'm an engineer by degree, so I come at my work a little differently than a lot of people do what I do for a living. And uh, I think in two by twos, right? I'm, I'm always trying two by two matrix or this, that, or the other. And of course, the place we always want to be is that upper right-hand quadrant, right? Um, always when you talk about growth or you talk about, um, you know, financial sort of any metric, you're trying to go up into the right. And so um, I was just fortunate to stumble on that, I think, as a, as a slogan for uh, the kind of work that I do. And then I've developed you now a framework around that. I like that. When when I initially you know saw it, I wasn't sure exactly what up and to the right meant. Can you? What are the? Can you mind telling us about the uh, what the, the what vertical and, and the horizontal axis? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So a, a two by two is a, a very simple way to look at two different concepts and oppose them, right? Uh, and then that easily throws out four different quadrants that you can talk about, where things are either um, more or less, higher or lower optimized or not. Uh, and um, when you have those four quadrants, um, then it's really uh, fairly simple to say, what do I need to do in each of those, depending on where I find myself, to move up and to the right, uh, to the quadrant that um, is the, the place where all things are, are optimized. Um, it's what Gartner Research calls the magic quadrant. If you follow uh, any of their research, or I'm sure some of your clients do, um, you know, you want to be in that upper right-hand quadrant because that's where all the magic happens. So the concept of up and to the right is not just for any one dimension for the X and Y axis. It's for multiple models. Um, initially, you know, I thought of the Stephen Covey, you know, important and but not sure. urgent. But it sounds yeah. like it works with, you know, the Boston Consulting Group matrix and, and all those other things that are out there. Because typically you want high, high, right? You want high experience and high results for your clients. Right. I can see that transportability in, in that sense. So thank you for, for clarifying yeah. that. It's yeah. not just the, as I was doing more research into your work, it's not just just the good for you, good for others model. It actually is, is cross models as well, it sounds like. That's right. Um, you know, the, the whole thing about up into the right is there's no such thing as a steady state, right? We're, mm -hmm. We fool ourselves. Um, but even if you think you're not changing, everything around you is, right? Your clients change, your market changes, your employees are changing. You know, Karen, your latest book is called No Dumbing Down. Can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to that theme? Yes. So uh, a lot of my work has to do with um, teams and helping teams be effective. And uh, No Dumbing Down is a response to teamwork as usual. So teamwork as usual is something we've all experienced, right? You get assigned to a team or volunteered for a team. And uh, what occurs is you get there and it's sort of not a place where you can work to your potential, right? To, to work in a way that's really optimal. And as a result of that, people don't, don't want to be on teams or don't believe in teams. And if, if you think about the team in general, uh, a team can only work at the level of the lowest performing member on the team. And so too often your A players have to dumb down to that lowest performing member. And it's not always that member's fault. Right? Sometimes they were not the right person to be on the team or they don't have good teaming skills or there are all kinds of reasons for that. Uh, but it is true that your A players do not want to work in places where they can't perform to their highest potential. And so No Dumbing Down was born out of a um, a hope that we could help uh, people and teams optimize uh, for potential uh, and so that uh, the teams could could perform uh, in the way that uh, that they had the, the, the potential and the, the chance to perform at. 
Because it seems like the downside of the dumbing down of the team is that your A players are going to leave because they're not seeing the opportunity, they're not seeing the challenges that they're normally looking for. Is that really the end product if you're if you're not being careful around that concept? That's absolutely right. That your A players um, will not hang around if they if they can't work to their potential, and uh, because of that, you'll have turnover, and it won't be the turnover you want. It'll be turnover over the players that you'd like to keep. That's a really fair point. Yeah, not all turnover is is bad turnover. What do you recommend for leaders to kind of identify the blind spots they have? on their team or in their approach to their team? Yeah, so blind spots are really interesting because we all have them, right? And we don't know what they are. It's the, it's the one thing, if you think about that, that people really worry about is the what don't I know? Because if we know about something, we can prepare for it in some ways. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a really good question. I'd say there are four things in particular that I think people should really pay attention to around blind spots. Um, the first thing is really to, um, sort of seek out diverse points of view, uh, that it is so important uh, that you hear from people who've had different experiences that you've had, who have different backgrounds that you do, maybe come from different industry that you do, uh, but to, to really um, seek out uh, those differences. Um, secondly, um, get some personal development feedback. Um, I typically do 360s with the people that I coach, and um, I cannot tell you how many blind spots, how many aha moments we have uncovered. And if you do these 360s in a way that's developmental rather than like your review, um, people will give you honest feedback because they know it's in the spirit of um, helping you develop. And, uh, and because of that, um, it can help you reduce blind spots. Um, uh, another thing would be to incorporate some data-driven monitoring processes into your system, right? So that um, just because you think things are going well does not mean that they are, or even just because you think things are going off the cliff does not mean that they are, uh, but to have some data that can help you with that. Um, and then um, I think the other thing to do is just to, uh, to make sure that you're constantly sort of, for me, I think curiosity is really important because it will help you uncover sort of new areas uh, that, and, and understanding more will always help you uh, decrease uh, your blind spots. It seems like there's a really big important theme there. One, the curiosity when they bring in late later has to be part of the other three too. Yes. So looking at it accurately, getting feedback from your environment, looking at the data, not just your own subjective opinion and having that curiosity. And I love the idea of doing it from a developmental perspective, not just from a review perspective, because it's for their benefit, not just yeah. for justification of some promotion or not in the other sense. Exactly. This curiosity and the seeking diverse opinions, does that also go in the, in the vein of making those ultimate important complex decisions? Or are there other factors we need to bring in when considering uh, those important decisions that leaders make? Um, I definitely think there are some other things. Um, um, you know, if we think about important decisions leaders have to make, at, at its base, everything is change management. And so um, having a good grounding in change management process is really important for leaders. Uh, you have to get uh, the people in your organization bought into you know, your vision where you're going, having them understand how it impacts them, uh, and make sure that they understand what they need to do in order to make that, um, that vision a success. And when you're growing, there's a lot of change. There's a lot of ambiguity. And you have to help people deal with that. Uh, and so I think that's a really important framework for people to use. Um, the other thing I would say is that you have to develop your team. Um, that too often leaders get caught up in having to do everything themselves, uh, which they know is not sustainable and is not scalable, um, but it's hard to let go of stuff. Uh, and so what you want to do is make sure that you've put a team around you, and in fact, a team around them, uh, that can grow as the organization grows uh, so that you can offload stuff and they can offload stuff and the organization can still scale. Uh, and then lastly, to make sure that you consider process, right? Um, part of what happens when you're on this high part, this uh, part of the S-curve, the hypergrowth part, is that um, there's so much going on that uh, you mentioned the Stephen Covey uh, or Eisenhower box earlier. Uh, we never get to the important, right? There's, there's no end of urgent to do. Uh, and so we have to create time to think for ourselves. And, um, and in doing that, to think about what, what is going on in a way that we can sort of think of it as a utility. 
uh, where we can put a process around it so we don't have to think about it again. It can just run. Um, because we don't want to get, I mean, what happens for big companies sometimes is they get stuck sort of at one end of this, this continuum. I think call it the SOP continuum, standard operating process or seat of the pants. And so we can get stuck in one place or the other. I mean, big, slow companies often have like way too much over here standard operating procedure that they try to apply to every situation. And startups often are way too far on the end here, seat of the pants. Uh, and you want to pick the right spot for the situation that you're in, not be wed to one answer or the other. So I think that's also super helpful for leaders as they try to deal with complexity. So it sounds like you really have to be mindful of where you are in that SOP continuum and have the adaptiveness to respond as the environment changes as well. Exactly. Yeah. When developing your team and in developing that trust, because I imagine a lot of the reasons that leaders and managers hold on to those decisions and those activities is because they haven't really given an opportunity for their team to show up. Right. What, what advice do you have for a leader that's hesitant, holding on and, and trying to do it all, even though they know that they can't? Yeah. So, you know, the, the first question is why, why are you doing that? Right. There's something um, in the leader's best that the leader thinks is in their best self-interest for them to be holding on. Um, and maybe they don't trust the team yet. Uh, maybe uh, the team hasn't shown that they will do things and get the kind of results the leader wants, um, or maybe it's just a bad habit. Uh, but first, to, you know, to do a little self-introspection and see if you can figure out why uh, you are holding on. Um, and then secondly, I always tell people to try new behaviors in low-risk situations. So if you're going to let go of something, do not take the biggest, most important thing that's sucking up all your time that you might want to get rid of, uh, right? Don't give that away first, but, but try with something smaller so that you can start to develop this level of trust and understanding with your team that they'll, they will be able to pick things up and carry them on, and then you can move on to, to delegating larger things. But uh, a lack of, uh, of good delegation skills, uh, not only will it be bad for your organization, but it's bad for you. You know, you become a single point of failure, and at that point you're not promotable, uh, and you are um, um, holding your organization back from being able to scale and grow. I love that idea of, of giving them smaller tasks that are not necessarily the, the make or break tasks that you have on your plate. That's a really strategic, simple way to get started in developing that trust. When there's a toxic team situation, mm. to, which I know you've done work and, and maybe you've come across more toxic teams than you, you care to, to mention, what if anything can be done, is this a situation where there is a possibility for redemption or uh, do you have to kind of cut your losses sometimes? Uh, both. Um, um, I think first just to talk about so briefly what is a toxic team. So uh, teams that are toxic, you know, we sort of know one when you see one, um, but uh, they have a lot of unresolved conflicts, right? Uh, and if conflicts are not resolved, that will um, actually wear the team down. Uh, or secondly, maybe you have a lot of uh, poor interpersonal skills because the skill set needed to be a good team member versus being a good individual contributor are not the same. There's overlap, but it's not the same set of skills. And so um, if, you have, um, if you don't have good productive team behavior norms, that can also be toxic. Um, and then um, lastly, uh, sometimes in teams, you see members who take advantage of what I think of as a flywheel, right? So they're just putting in the minimum amount of effort to keep that wheel going around. Uh, it's also a dumbed down team. Um, but if you're, if you're on a team like that and, uh, and you're a high performer, high achiever, that's not a place you want to be. So if you see those things going on, what can you do? Well, um, understand the team will only improve if the team members want it to improve. Right? So if it's just you and no one else is unhappy with the situation, nothing's going to happen with that team. Um, but you can, uh, you know, if they, if they, I would check in with the team and see how they respond to the idea that the performance could be improved um, and see if you can get a team commitment to dealing with the three issues that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then um, if the team won't do that, if they're not interested in changing their behaviors, you know, I, I, I then have to think that it's time to think about leaving the team. And if that's the case, um, it can be hard because you have to be aware of any office politics about leaving the team. Um, but hopefully you trust your manager enough uh, that you're able to have a conversation there about potentially other ways that the objective could be accomplished uh, using uh, fewer resources. And if the team is really that bad, I'm sure there are multiple other ways 
uh, that we can get the, the needs of the teen charter met. So it sounds like you have to hit it head on, have those conversations. If you're not the manager leader with that person, with the team themselves, see if you can get buy-in towards a positive end. And if not, you have to do some soul searching, look for other opportunities and it may be, maybe part ways or find another path for you. Like many people exactly. do, of course. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Because if you're stuck, if you're a high performer, a member and you're on a team that is toxic, certainly you're not going to be bringing your best. And I, and I know that from that this is one of your passions is actually helping people to bring out their best. Obviously, getting out of a toxic environment or improving that would be one way. What are some other ways that leaders can bring out the best from their team members? Yeah, such an important leadership skill, right? Uh, developing and growing your team, um, because without that, I think when times get tough, you don't have you don't have much left. Um, so I'd say the, f- the first thing that leaders should do is, A, be aware of your responsibility to develop your team. Um, I often just use a very simple nine box that looks at performance versus potential. Uh, and if you look at the sort of nine boxes that fall out of that, again, we want to be up into the right, high performance, high potential, right? Um, if, you, if, you, if you use something like that on a consistent basis, um, you, can, you can draw out what your responsibility as a manager to develop people where they are. Right? This is not a one-size-fits-all answer. Uh, if you have someone who's high potential, low performance, that's a different answer than someone who is uh, low potential, moderate performance or something like that, right? So, um, so I think using that kind of a system can be super useful. Um, and then I think something that's very useful that we don't do often enough is to ask the employee what they need to perform better novel idea, right? It is. Um, and, and to make sure that they have the feedback that they're not performing up to par right now. Uh, I think it's Kim Scott in her ra- Radical Candor uh, book and talk where she, where she talks about people get their very best feedback on the day you fire them, right? So that's, we don't want to do that. We want to give people feedback early so that they can do something about it. Uh, so making sure the employee knows that, they're, uh, that they need some development. Um, ask the employee what their um, what their goals are, right? And, um, and and then you can help develop them to move towards their goals. But if there are current issues uh, that, that need development for the current job, um, ask them what they need. Ask them what's standing in their way. And uh, most of the time, they'll tell you, and it's something you could probably do something about. Well, it sounds like you definitely need to have some trust and obviously have the yes. employee's best interest to add heart as well and, and be willing to have that that kind of conversation. You know, conversations are, are certainly a theme here on Key Conversations. And I wanted to yeah. know if you don't mind me asking, you know, when you think back on your career so far, what has been some of the more profound conversation or the most profound conversation, if you can remember, that's impacted where you are today? Yeah, I'll give you two, but I'll make them brief. Um, the first was I went to a conference um, that interface flooring. I don't know if you know of Ray Anderson, but he was he was a, a big leader in sustainability and flooring, uh, carpet in particular. And this was the world's largest floor covering company. Uh, is highly toxic, uh, and then we you know we throw all this carpet away at the end. Plus, it's petroleum to make it. And he put on a, a sustainability conference. Um, he sort of woke up one morning and realized what he and his company were doing to the planet and. Um, that conference and the people I met and um, helping me think bigger and think differently, just getting exposed to, exposed to something completely different, um, and conversations I had with him around that were, uh, were highly influential and led me uh, to my Zen teacher, uh, which has been maybe the biggest influence on my life. It's just this ability to, uh, to sort of take, um, take note of where I am and what's going on and to, to listen and see from different perspectives. Uh, and I think if people can do those things, uh, whether they get them in a conversation or just an aha moment, um, that they can um, they can change their lives uh, for the better. Fantastic. Karen, thank you so much for joining us on Key Conversations for Leaders. Can you tell us what's the best way for our leaders and our, our, our viewers and our listeners to stay in touch and, and find out more about your work? Great. And anyone, <laughs> including our readers, um, sure. you can follow me at Karen Walker US on any social media platform. Uh, my website is KarenWalker.us. So just KarenWalker.us or KarenWalkerUS. Thanks so much for asking. Awesome. Thanks for being here. And for the rest of you, thanks so much for watching and listening. Until next time, develop yourself, empower others, and lead by example.